over. Okay. Hey everyone, this is Essential Salts, and uh, I got a comment from somebody that was so good that I decided to do a whole video uh, responding to it. So this is from Hog Vlog Films, and uh, they asked me here on the meaning of Nietzsche's Overman, Arrows of Longing, Part One of Two. So this is a part of the two-part series I did on the Overman concept. Uh, this is what he writes, quote, your podcasts have helped me see resentment as the greatest driver of human misery on earth, that it's uh, self-inflicted and utterly futile and poisonous to the well-being of both self and those it's directed at, poisonous to the well-being. Okay. It's hard to understand how Nietzsche missed it in himself. Let me explain. I've now listened to all of your Nietzsche podcasts, most of them twice. They're deep, complex, well-organized, and outstanding. I feel like I have at least a basic grasp of Nietzsche's philosophical project and what led to it. The central negative quality underlying human morality appears to be a, to be resentment to Nietzsche. The remedy to this is a, a more fati, uh, which is what he means there, to embrace one's fate, no matter how seemingly unjust or tragic, because we all serve the becoming of the overman and have no choice anyway. Free will is illusory, fate governs all. But there are contradictions that trouble me here. Not enough to dismiss Nietzsche's insights into human nature and consciousness or his critiques of social structures, religion, philosophies, and their moral underpinnings, but contradictions which call into question his remedy. It seems clear that Nietzsche views resentment as bad in and of itself. I suspect that this derives from Nietzsche's love of classical antiquity and what he saw as its decline through decadence, especially the slave uprising of Christianity, which was its death knell. In short, Nietzsche's philosophy was itself driven by resentment. Resentment that the lower man had gained the upper hand and had destroyed what was best, most beautiful, and highest in mankind. His resentment is incoherent given his very own philosophy, however. If all is faded, there is no point in resenting anything. Quite the opposite. A morphati, right? The lower man is no better or worse than the lower man. We have no choice or agency in the matter. Celebrating or resenting the coming, overcoming of either is pointless. Accepting both without prejudice or judgment is more logical and productive to well-being, and ironically, human progress. What he got right, in my estimation, was to strive towards embracing your nature and circumstances rather than resenting them or anything else. In short, the overman and the lower man are spurious artifacts of the primitive dichotomous reasoning system Nietzsche employed to dissect reality. Philosophizing with a hammer, more like brain surgery with a chainsaw, but I suppose it was the best tool available at the time. Okay, so thank you for that. Uh, I've seen Hog Vlog uh, post on some other videos as well. And uh, so thank you for your comments. Um, so I, your comment made me think a lot because I, I was initially going to like type out a response and I was like, well, that's gonna be a nightmare because I'm gonna have to go into great detail, but I think I can get it across just speaking about it uh, relatively quickly, what my response would be like. And the first thing I would say is that I think you're right, that Nietzsche is somewhat resentful of Christianity. Now, I some, I think a lot of people would uh, take me to task for that. I'm not saying that this is necessarily implied by his philosophy. I think his philosophy itself would actually reject such a notion. It's actually just my own psychological reading of Nietzsche. Um, and I think this is evidenced by the fact that he sees it, I think, to Nietzsche's credit here, he sees that as a flaw and something that he has to get over and that it's akin to Zarathustra in the final book of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the final chapter, the sign, Zarathustra finally overcomes what? His pity for the higher man. And I've talked about this before a little bit, but pity and resentment kind of have this strange relationship, right? And that they are... Um, they are mutually arising and mutually um, enabling. They sort of form a vicious circle with one another. And it's an open question as to which one of those is more fundamental. But I think Nietzsche identifies pity as being more fundamental. And whether you agree with that or not, I think it then comes out here in this idea at the end of Zarathustra. Enough of my pity for the higher man is what Zarathustra says. And so to just go into this briefly, I mean, it, he says this in his other works too, in Beyond Good and Evil, that basically the slave morality has ground under all of the 
potentially higher man, that it's naturally hostile to everything that is extraordinary, everything that is genius, everything that is um, perhaps, you know, what does he say often? Strange, wicked, and questionable, right? And that's sort of what Nietzsche advocates for, is the exception, the exception as the justification rather than the rule. That's one way of sort of looking at Nietzsche's outlook that isn't often stated, that um, I think is very interesting, that it's he always looks at and emphasizes the exceptions um, as some sort of special thing in their own sort of class that sort of defy being classed into a given category. And oftentimes it is the role of collective power, of cultural power, societal power, state power to um, smash that down. I mean, we have the Japanese proverb, right? It's the tallest nail is the one that is hammered back down. So. That's what Nietzsche sort of laments in Beyond Good and Evil, and that's what Zarathustra sort of laments. He has pity, he admits in his own work, right, that he has pity for the higher man. And so, of course, so even though I think people, they're naturally going to be on their heels about saying Nietzsche had resentment, because I think a lot of people actually make this critique that you've made, which isn't to downplay it. I mean, it's just to, to give it credence almost, like a lot of people notice this in Nietzsche, that he seems to be... He, I mean, it doesn't seem to be. He's at war with Christianity, and that always sort of raises the question, is he resentful? And I, and I think people use that to tear down his philosophy, which isn't, I think, necessarily um, fair. Well, it's poisoning the well at the very least, right? I mean, it, in any case, we can nevertheless raise that question about Nietzsche himself on a personal level, on a subjective level, on a psychological level about Nietzsche. I think it's a fair judgment to make about him because of the fact that he admits that he has pity for the higher man and therefore we can see that he might be resentful to someone who would harm or crush or smother the great man or the great individual in the womb right but he recognizes it as a flaw as we've said and it's one of his final things to get over but zarathustra overcomes it now remember zarathustra is a sort of idealized nietzsche so does nietzsche actually overcome it we don't know but i think the very thing you're pointing at to Amor Fati, that's not far from Nietzsche's mind, like the very critique that you're making of him. I think Nietzsche actually understood that and made that critique of himself and understood that uh, he needed to be more embracing of fate and necessity. And you have, um, uh, who who is it? I think it's Heidegger who said that there's a thirsting for eternity throughout all of uh, Nietzsche's writing, that even though he's this um, philosopher of becoming, uh, he has this uh, sort of, I don't know, undertone of, I mean, you see it in his notes in Will to Power, where he says the highest expression of will to power is to stamp becoming with the character of being. And that's sort of what he's doing with his eternal return idea. And so Heidegger notices that, um, even though I, I should just say, I don't really agree with Heidegger's interpretations of Nietzsche. Um, and I definitely don't agree with his interpretations of Heraclitus, but it's neither here nor there. Um, in any case, I think that's Nietzsche in one of his poems in the Dionysian Dithyrams uh, called Fame and Eternity. He sort of talks about, uh, there's like an encounter with this eternal star, the star of eternity. And I just remember a line where he's like, I love you because you are eternal and because you are necessary. And there's this, that dual tendency in Nietzsche to just embrace necessity, amor fati, e embrace eternity. Uh, and then there's that other side, though. And what is that other side? And that seems to be what you're saying was driven by resentment. I don't think it necessarily is. And this is where I think Nietzsche being self-critical was maybe a way of keeping himself on the right track intellectually. Um without letting his own moral prejudices steer him wrong. Now, obviously, he's still writing from his perspective, and he has a very clear agenda in his work. But um, I don't know. You can still try and keep that from, um, you know, disrupting your ability to, say, do a, an etymological or philological study of the Greeks to derive, like, truths about them, right? And so Nietzsche was very much against projecting his own views onto the Greeks and very much against trying to derive his own views from things he learned from the Greeks. Um, so I think the thing that I would say to sort of answer you though, so we've, we've got, we've gone over how 
yeah, this is actually a flaw in Nietzsche. And it's one that Nietzsche recognizes, though. And I think that he, at least ideally, thinks that he should overcome. But furthermore, then there's sort of the question of, but is there actually, I mean, what do you say here at the bottom? The primitive dichotomous reasoning system Nietzsche employed to dissect reality. And you're referring to the Dionysus versus the crucified thing of this opposition between which way the overman or the you put it lower man really it's the last man um, there's not really a concept in Nietzsche that the the that we're like becoming a lower thing so much like the last man's a very specific image and I love it because it actually very much in my opinion maps on to like the modern person the character of the modern person um so this is all I'll say about that Nietzsche also recognizes that we need a goal. And the idea where you're saying, if all is faded, there's no point in resenting anything. Um, and there's another thing you said. Um, to embrace one's fate, no matter how seemingly unjust or tragic, because we all serve the becoming of the overman and have no choice anyway, free will is illusory, fate governs all. Uh, the thing about that is, you know, man's the measuring animal. We prefer, we judge, we esteem things, we denounce things. So you're naturally going to have some values. And, you know, the will would rather will nothingness as a value than not aim at any value at all. And that's why Nietzsche writes in The Antichrist that what his philosophy is culminating in and what he feels it needs is a straight line, a goal. A yes, a no. He needs, to, he needs to, if he understands man as a bridge to something, what is it a bridge to? He has to ask that question. He frames it in this dichotomous manner, I think not out of Manichaeanism, but because he genuinely conceives of it as a direction, as a directional question. Um, you know, it's really one thing that he's talking about, right? The overman and the last man are two, they're the end products and move, proceeding in two different directions from where we are today, but two directions on what? The same scale, the same dimension, you might say. Nietzsche calls it life. Uh, we might call it uh, something like, or, or Nietzsche might say life ascending, life affirming, life nourishing, life expanding, species nourishing, species rearing, right? Um, if you don't already know what that is, if you're just in the audience listening, I'm sure that Hog Vlog Films knows what that is because he's listened to all the episodes twice, he says. But, um, you know, it's too much to go into here. But what, what, in what ways can you manifest your will to power in such a manner that it actually expands the scope of your power? Um, th that would be a short way. Uh, in what way can you live that would be a positive feedback loop or a virtuous circle? you might say, um, to where life is ever expanding and increasing, health is ever expanding and increasing. Um, that is the question for Nietzsche. And how, in what way would it look like if you lived in a way that was a negative feedback loop in the vicious circle going in the opposite direction, right? That's what this is. So he's, it's actually even worse than you're saying it of dichotomous reasoning, because really it's just he's using a single dimension. It's a monism of will to power. That's Nietzsche's ethic. It's a monism. And so it's very easy for him to come up with his yes or no, right? But the point is that Nietzsche does believe we actually need to have a definitive yes or no as to our values and our goals in life. And that however much we may say, I accept whatever happens. I don't consider my rational, deliberative ego consciousness to be driving this thing that I'm a living creature like everything else, and that, as Arthur Schopenhauer says, a man wills what he wills, but does not choose what he wills. Nevertheless, the reality is right there, like in that statement of Schopenhauer's. I don't choose what I will, but I do will what I will. Right? You do have values. You do have things you esteem, things you want, things you don't want. Um, how do you order all of those values? How do you go about pursuing those values? How do you determine whether a desire you're pursuing is actually commensurate with your broader values or not? 
these are questions that I think are Nietzsche, if we interpret him charitably, which I try to do, I think we can interpret him to mean that these are should be treated as meta ethical questions. They're not Nietzsche giving us universal moral dictates. That's the entire point of how often the books of Zarathustra conclude with him dismissing his disciples and telling them, Zarathustra may have lied to you. The poets lie too much. Here's my way, where is yours? And if you're asking me where the way is, it does not exist. So Nietzsche's perfectly clear about this. These are not questions of him coming to some sort of moral dictate. But these are what you might call, uh, what Nietzsche would call, veritable conscience questions of the intellect, um, where you, you do actually um, benefit from coming into a better understanding and self-reflection of exactly what we're talking about, of your own order of values, what's going on inside of you, what you're aimed at, what your goal is, what it's leading to, and is it making you stronger or weaker, healthier or un unhealthier? That's all that it boils down to. And yeah, it's true. Um, it's not a matter of your free will, whether you heed that advice and carry that out or not, but you still have to do it. It's sort of like, well, who's to decide, you know, what my goals will be in life and my values? Who else could? No one else can. So that is left to you. And Nietzsche simply tries to derive clarity about how we go about that process. And so to me, I that's how I think about all of this, and that's what I've distilled out of all of this. And that it's merely an expansion of your own knowledge, your own self-knowledge. And never has the expansion of your knowledge limited your options, right? It's just giving you more options of how to act. And, you know, it's like the, the, the problem with the free will thing is like, <laughs> imagining these are like going to be freely made options. But it's just simply a matter of like, whatever would be the best thing for you to fulfill your values, you might not even know to do that until it comes into your consciousness of what your values are and how they're properly ordered and all this and that. Um, so in any case, this would be uh, my response to you, Hogblog Films. I think uh, this is a very thoughtful reply and criticism. And I realize that at the end here, right, the, the as I'm sure you're familiar with, that, that Nietzsche's uh, straight line goal, yes, no, his standard of life affirming, his religion of the Dionysian, his demand that we go in this direction and not the other one, the overman direction and not the last man direction. That is Nietzsche's way. So you do have to find your own way. And so I, la I laud you um, coming, you know, studiously attending to all of Nietzsche's philosophy and saying, this is what I've gotten out of it and this is my position and um, I'm not going to, you know, uh, this is wonderfully blasphemous towards Nietzsche, and it's not, um, you know, yeah, don't slavishly, everyone take the example of this guy, don't slavishly, like, uh, just adopt the philosophy of Nietzsche for your life. Um, but that said, I think the way, you know, just the way I've given of how I think about all of this, to me, it seems like a good idea to always be thinking about yourself in the big picture. In, in yourself as something that's transforming, right? And not as a fixed final thing. What direction am I headed? Am I going towards more health, more life, or not? So that's my answer.